But uh, last time we started talking about this question of how you build this programmable computing machine. And we started off with the whole question of data representation. Uh, since we're talking digital computers, and more specifically we're talking binary digital computers, our minimal representation of information is a zero or a one. That is not the only one that has been explored. There's a whole world of uh, trinary which you can look at if you're curious sometime. We don't talk about it in this class, but it actually um, has three different data values, minus one, zero, and one, and thankfully that didn't catch on because it's kind of confusing. But uh, zero and one is challenging enough, and so we use Boolean values to represent information, and we came up with these ways of representing unsigned integers and signed integers. Remember that the... Uh, the first one is B2U that takes a bit vector X and turns it into an unsigned integer value by treating each bit as the, uh, you know, a different place in a uh, base 2 representation. And then the B2T is 2's complement signed representation, again recalling that there is a 1's complement representation as well. And so the 2's complement just uses the topmost bit as a signed bit, shifts over the value. When the topmost bit is 1, it shifts it over by a fixed amount, and then we use that to get our negative values. But if the topmost bit is zero, then it's going to be a positive value, or zero. Okay, so those were our data representations that we talked about last time. And we started talking about how to build interesting things like arithmetic. Remember, we did this whirlwind tour of how to implement arithmetic using logic gates. So uh, thankfully, that's not something that you have to know very much about. I just want you to see that it's possible. And obviously, if you've taken any uh, you know, digital electronics design courses, you've probably seen this in much gorier detail than we talk about it in this class. Okay, so we're going to take our logic gates, and we're going to start building them into components that we can use to build a programmable computer, i.e. something with a crank on it that we can turn and answers come out. So we would like to be able to do that without getting bored. Uh, we know how to implement addition, but there are a few other things that we need. And we're going to talk about them briefly today. We need signal buses of some kind. A signal bus is just a way of moving values from one place in the computer to another place in the computer. So that's easy enough. Mainly it's just bunches of wires. Then we need an arithmetic logic unit, which is a way of doing computations on input values. So you can think of this like a function that takes inputs as well as a third input that says what to do with those inputs. And then we compute an output based on the data inputs and the control input, and we compute some answer. So that's the arithmetic logic unit. And then we need memory. We need a way of remembering things so that we can refer to them later. And you'll see actually that this becomes a, a critical central component of our computer being able to operate because our instructions are just so dumb. And so we need a way of storing the result of an instruction in a location, and then we can refer to it later so we can do something else to it. And then we can build up more sophisticated uh, computations through memory locations. Okay, so these are the three things that we need. Okay, so I already talked about buses. They're a set of wires that transfer signals from one part of the processor to another part. And it tends to be that we design them to be a fixed bit width, i.e., this is the number of bits we can transmit efficiently. So x86-64, you can tell from the 64 in the name. It's a 64-bit processor. That means that many of its data buses are 64 bits wide. It makes it very easy to move 64-bit values around in the processor. If I have an 8-bit processor, well, its data bus is probably only 8-bit wide. So if I want to move 32 bits of data around, I've got to do four steps of 8 bits. So it's going to be slower. Okay? So uh, it tends to be that these buses have specific widths. They're used all over the place. So we have moving data between the processor and memory or peripherals. Um, and we can have different kinds of buses as well. We may have a bus that's used for transmitting data. We may have another bus that's used for transmitting addresses. And uh, a lot of times you'll have control buses as well that, uh, that transfer information between different parts of the processor just to make it do what it's supposed to do. Okay, so we normally draw them just with a little slash across them because who wants to draw 64 lines all next to each other? So we draw one line and put a slash through it. And oftentimes, if we want to say how many lines there are, we'll just write the number 
you know, sort of below and to the right or something like that. So if this was a 64-bit bus, we might have a line, a slash, and then 64 written to say this is a 64-bit bus. Okay? Easy peasy. Um, when we have an individual signal, we would indicate that by having a line with no slash. So the slash is your indicator that there's multiple lines there. It's a bus, not just a sing single signal. Okay, um, we sometimes need to route signals to different places based on control uh, inputs. And so we have these various components called multiplexers and demultiplexers that we can use to control where a particular signal ends up. And so here's a really simple example. We have a four input multiplexer. Okay. What we're saying is we have four inputs, D0 through D3. We love numbering from zero in most areas of computer. Databases are the one area where people number from one, but uh, thankfully we're not in that world right now. So D0 through D3, and the two address inputs allow us to select which of those data inputs we want to appear on the output. So that's a nice, simple way of saying, I, you know, I have multiple inputs, I'd like to select this particular one. Uh, of course, we need four, I mean, I'm sorry, if we have four inputs, we need two address lines, because two squared is four. So we can have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. That'll select one of the four data inputs to uh, transmit to the output. So that's a multiplexer. You can also have a demultiplexer, which is just a multiplexer in reverse. We have one input and we want to route it to one of n outputs. So again, we have address inputs which say which of the outputs it should route to, and that one input will appear on one of those four outputs. Now, what do the other output lines get if they're not selected? Well, typically they just get zero. Okay? So um, dn will be transmitted to one of those, or else it'll just be zero if it's not selected. Okay, any questions? Easy, right? And of course, you can take this and scale it up. Like, I'd like, instead of having individual data lines, I'd like to have a bus going into each one of those things so that I could route 8 bits of data from one location to another based on some control inputs. Okay, so these are powerful tools. Let's see, arithmetic and logic unit. So uh, typically it's drawn as a, an upside-down trapezoid with a byte taken out of it. That's how I tend to describe it. And you can see that you have two inputs, they will be multiple bits because we want to do a computation that's interesting. So uh, nobody really ever thought that one bit of computation would be exciting. So maybe it's four bits, maybe it's 64 bits, depending on your processor. You have your two inputs and your output, and your control inputs say, what do you want to do to the two input values? Okay. <coughs> so like it says on the slide, two W-bit inputs and a set of control inputs you do something to one or both of those inputs. And the reason why I say you do it to one or both is because maybe you're doing something that requires two inputs, like addition or multiplication. Or maybe you're just shifting one of those inputs left by one bit, or you're inverting it or something like that. So you don't always need both inputs, but many of the operations will involve two inputs. Okay? So that's why uh, we pretty much usually always use A and sometimes use B depending on the operation being performed. Okay, And so we get a W-bit result, that's R, and we also get various status outputs. And this kind of goes hand in hand with what we talked about last lecture, that we may want to generate status results indicating whether or not our computation was successful. So we have the high carry out, which we can treat as an unsigned overflow. If we know we're doing unsigned arithmetic and the high carry out happens to be one, we should freak out and, and talk to somebody about this situation. Okay? Uh, we have another one, the, uh, what is it, the overflow flag, and I'm pointing those two out for a reason. Carry flag is unsigned overflow. Typically, the overflow flag is signed overflow. So the overflow flag will indicate you're adding two signed values. Let's say you were adding 120 and 110, and you were doing a signed representation and the output is now negative because it wrapped around. Okay, so signed overflow would indicate that you had a problem and you should probably go and uh, tell somebody that you had an issue. Okay? But those are some example status outputs. Any questions? All right, so this is nice and easy again. The easy way to, I love thinking about it as a programmable function. It takes its inputs, it takes a control input, and does some computation for you. Easy peasy. All right. Uh, example operation. So the control signals 
become operation codes, if you will. Uh, all of this is uh, abbreviated as opcode, but um, you can see that you have various control inputs that tell the ALU to do various things. So this is a simple example. This is completely contrived. Okay, I just made this up out of thin air. But uh, real processors are real ALUs. You can actually buy ALUs on a chip if you want to build your own processor out of like 80 integrated circuits or something, which will be slow, but hey, it'll be fun. Um, and the ALU will have a little data um, document that says this is how to do addition and this is how to do various other things. Okay? So we have these control inputs. And so if you feed stuff into the ALU, it will do stuff for you. Okay, exciting. Now the last thing to do is have some kind of memory. Okay, and so this is basically so that we don't have to type every single instruction in as we go. We'd like the computer to re remember instructions for us and also the data that we need. So we're going to have a very simple memory. It's like an array. If you've ever done any programming, which you should have done at this point, uh, and you've worked with arrays, then that's basically exactly what our model will be. We have an address, which is just an index from the start of the memory, and each index will have some W bit value that it stores. Okay. That's all that it's going to be. Okay. Uh, we also need to know if we're reading or writing to the memory. So again, we'll keep it really simple. We'll have one control input that's the right bit. And if the right bit is zero, then we're not writing. We're reading. And so we'd expect a value to come out D out. If we're writing, then we'll set WR to 1. And whatever is on DN will get stored at whatever address is specified. Everybody got it? So easy. Um, there is one thing that I want to say, though. I am asserting that we can build all these things out of our logic gates. And I hope that as a Caltech student, you will say, wait a minute, I want to see proof of that. That's a good policy to have in general in life. Um, so what I want to say about that is it is beyond the scope of CS24 for us to talk about that specific topic. But nonetheless, because I want you to see that it is possible, if you are curious, um, on the Moodle, and it's already there, you can look at it if you're, if you're bored of, with all of this, um, you can go look and there's a document that describes how to build all of these various components out of our logic gates. And since we know we can build any logic gate out of AND and NOT, you could figure out how to build all of those things out of a very primitive set of building blocks, which is pretty dang awesome if you think about it. Okay, So um, you do not need to know that material. That's basically for your edification. And what you'll notice actually in this class is you know, since a lot of these things are sort of the tip of a very interesting iceberg, um, a lot of times what I'll do is say, here's some information and here are some sources if you want to go learn more about a particular topic. And so um, one of the other things I put up yesterday was the uh, CS24 additional reading material. So if you see a topic and you're like, wow, that sounds totally amazing, um, you can go get this or that book and it'll talk about it in much more depth. I tend to have all those books in my office because I'm excited about all of them. Okay, But uh, anyway, you can read about it and learn more about it, but it's not really necessary. In general, we don't expect you to reason about things uh, below the level of this is an ALU and this is a memory and we hook them up and do junk with them. Okay? Let's see. So let's hook up our components like this. Okay? Kind of an interesting way of hooking things up. You'll see that uh, we already have a couple of weird aspects of this already. First of all, we have two memory banks. That's because we want to keep things simple. The two memory banks will actually be identical copies of each other. Notice that the data in for both of them comes from the same bus. Okay? So D0 goes to both banks, D1 goes to both banks. Everything is all wired up so that they'll get identical inputs, but the outputs go to different sides of the ALU so that we can do computations. Okay? Also, we are ignoring the ALU status outputs right now. We just don't care. All right? Now, the stuff that feeds into this assembly, we've got one memory bank's read address, the other memory bank's read address, are we writing? What address do we write to? What are the control inputs to the ALU? All of those things together are control inputs that we can use to tell our machine to do stuff. Okay? And so that is an instruction. 
And by feeding various instructions into this assembly, we can make it do things, which is awesome. Okay, so uh, yeah, like I say here, the ALU operation, the addresses of the inputs, whether the result should be stored, and if so, where to store it. Okay, now you can imagine that some things are dependent on other things being specified. If my write bit is zero, then I don't care about specifying a write address. Now this thing still expects there, you know, there will be wires and they'll have to be set to something. We can just set them to zero or something. If we have a situation where the ALU is doing a single operand operation, then the second memory bank's read address could be zero because we don't care. It's going to be ignored. Okay, but uh, you know, this those set of inputs specify an instruction. Okay, so what we need to do is come up with a series of instructions that make our computer do something that's interesting to us, and that's how we can program it. Okay, we still need a way of feeding it instructions because again um, it turns out that uh, old computers and uh, you know you should be really happy that this isn't your life although um, I suppose that uh, probably more than a few of us would find it exciting to do at least once but there were computers back in the 60s and the 70s where you would have a bank of switches and you would set all the switches and then you toggle another switch and that would load that instruction into a memory and then go on to the next address and then you set all the switches again for the next instruction and toggle that switch and it would store the next instruction into the uh, computer memory. That's how you loaded the bootstrap program. Crazy. I'm so glad we don't have to do that now. Um, but anyway, we have an instruction memory which contains our bit patterns that tell this thing what to do. And you'll see that we also need to keep track of where we are in the instruction memory. So we have another memory to hold what we call a program counter. What is the current instruction we're on? It starts at zero, and then it just increments every time we're ready to go on to the next instruction. So you can see it's all wired up with its own special ALU that says one of my inputs is one, and I'm always going to add. Okay, increment. Easy peasy. Any questions so far? All right, so we have our assembly. We have a way of feeding it. It's exciting, right? Now we can start making it do things. So what you notice is that the instructions for programming processors are really basic. In fact, even on CISC processors, which support all kinds of fancy things that you can do. There, you know, I won't even go into it right now. We'll talk about it more in a couple of weeks. But um, even with CISC processors, the instructions are really limited. So it oftentimes is that we cannot compute our entire program in one instruction. We may want to do an operation, we have to break it down into a whole bunch of instructions that will actually together do the computation that we want. Okay, So we have to string together the sequence of instructions. They have to communicate somehow. Remember all we have, pull some values out of memory, feed them through the ALU, tell the ALU what to do, take that output and stuff it some other location in memory. So we need to basically have these instructions communicate through memory. Okay, so. This instruction will store its memory value here, and then this other instruction will read from that memory location, and we'll build up a more sophisticated set of computations. Okay, This is what we're going to implement. Nice and simple. Doesn't take very many steps. There is definitely no single instruction that does this computation. It would be really weird, honestly, to have a processor that did exactly that thing uh, with one instruction. Okay, but you can see what we're doing here. We multiply b by 2. That's the first thing that has to happen. We subtract whatever that result is from a, and then we only want the low four bits of it. We only want the low nibble. So we bitwise and it with our mask. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Okay, so that's our program. Really simple. So you tend to find that you go through a series of steps when you write these programs, and the set of steps is very common, so you'll learn this pattern or this approach for how to take a program, decompose it into the instructions, and implement it on the processor. So the first thing we need to do is figure out where our inputs will come from and where our output should go. Okay, so whoever runs this program will be expecting the output somewhere. Okay? So the inputs are what? Well, this part's easy, right? It's like, is Donnie asking a trick question? What well, kind of? Um, a and B are obvious inputs, right? 
We would like to be able to compute this for whatever values of a and b can be represented in our w-bit computer. And then in this case, w is 8. So um, 0 to 255 for both a and b. So those are obvious. Do we have any other inputs? Yes? No? Silence. Yeah. Well, where will we be writing to is being figured out later. I saw a hand over here, though. Yes? So those will also be inputs, but those will be in our instruction memory. Yeah. We definitely need 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a, you can see that there's a lot of interesting questions. Since we're building a general purpose computer, there's not going to be some magical instruction that says, I want to load this bit mask of 00001111 into it. Our computer's really simple right now. Like, that's easy to do on x86-64. You'll be surprised at how many things you can do. Okay? In fact, when you write programs in assembly, I don't want you to freak out about having to write programs for x86-64 because it's such a sophisticated processor that you can do a lot of stuff with it pretty easily. In fact, like since we moved to 64-bit, I've almost been tempted to make the programs harder because it's just an easy processor to program. Okay? But our processor is simple. So even things like 00001111 needs to be stored somewhere. It's an input. It has to be part of our program. Okay? And you'll see this in real life programs is that most of the time they'll have a section called either .ro data or .data where they store all the constants that are needed by your program. Okay? That's a very common approach. In fact, it's used by any program that you've ever written that was compiled. Uh, so output, obvious again, is C. So we need to have um, some places where we store these things. So uh, here are the givens. This is just a little bit more. If, if you will, this is part of your instruction set architecture. We have eight locations. So addresses are three bits because we need to be able to represent values of 0 to 7. Data values are eight bits wide. So we can represent values from zero to 255, or if we're doing signed math, it would be minus 128 to plus 127. Okay? Um, this is very typical design in that uh, our address and data buses are actually different widths. Okay? Even 64 bit processors are that way. Anybody know how wide the data bus or the address bus is on x86 64 for funsies? When you store an address in your program, it's going to be 64 bits because it's a 64-bit data bus. But the address buses on x86-64 are actually only 48 bits. Okay, so I think you can access up to 128 terabytes or something like that of RAM. So, you know, in danger of running out, but uh, we'll be okay probably. Okay, so this is the design for the processor. And so this is what we're going to do for laying out our values. Address 0 will be where it expects A. Address 1 is where it will expect B. Uh, address 4 will be where we store our bit mask. Why? I don't know. Just because we could put it in any of the other available addresses. The only ones that are really critical here are 0, 1, and 7. Because you're going to notice that we kind of have this convention that the inputs are at the beginning of the memory and the output will be at the end of the memory. So uh, address 7 will be C. Okay? And for whatever, you know, for kicks, we're going to store the bit mask at address 4. Okay. So step 2, let me ask a question. Any questions about this? I just don't, don't want to go forward without um, making sure everybody's on the same page. All righty. Okay. So uh, next thing we have to do is decompose our program. Now, we already sort of know how to do this. Because remember, this is a program. And I already gave a description in English of what this would do. What's the first computation that we have to actually do here? If, if I'm reading this off and I was computing it by hand, what's the first thing I'd have to do? Can I do the bitwise AND first? No. What do I have to do first? Yeah, I have to do 2B first. Right? That's the first thing that has to happen. And then the second thing that has to happen is, yes, A minus whatever that thing is. And then finally, I can do my, my uh, bitwise AND operation. Okay? So you can see that we need to be able to take this and figure out what sequence of steps we need to break it into. Okay? 
And obviously to do that, we need to know what operations our processor supports. And so this is just a table from earlier that Donnie made up in his spare time. And uh, we have all these various control inputs we can feed into our ALU. And if we give various memory locations, we can compute things. Okay. So first step, 2B. How do we compute 2B? What are all the ways we could do this? We actually heard one earlier. Yeah. We could add B to itself. That will definitely compute 2B. What's another one we can do? Yeah, we can do a shift left. We're going to talk about this a little bit more. But one of the nice things about base 2 and all our little bits and junk is if we shift stuff left one bit, it's like multiplying it by 2. If I shift things left two bits, multiplying it by 2 squared or 4 and so forth. And same thing with shift right. It has a, a nice analog in uh, division. Okay, so uh, go us. We can take advantage of that. Because it turns out that on processors, typically addition and subtraction is slower than bit shifting. And so when you have these um, multiply or divide by powers of 2, you definitely want to do bit shifts instead. Okay, so perform 2B. We'll do it as B plus B, because um, I like adding, I guess. And so we'll subtract that from A, and then we'll bitwise AND. Can we do each of these steps? Well, we have an add operation, we have a subtract operation, and we have um, a bitwise and operation. So we can do all of these things. Yay, go us. If we couldn't, we might have to break this down even more. And we'll see an example of this later in the lecture, that uh, some operations aren't supported by this, and so we have to implement them ourselves. OK, so we need to assign locations to the intermediate values, because remember, how do the instructions communicate with each other? Well, through memory locations. One instruction's got to plop its value down somewhere so that another instruction can read it off. So result of B plus B will go into location 2. And then the A minus 2B can refer to that value, and it'll store its answer into location 3 so that the bitwise AND can refer to those values and compute into location 7. So you can already see that we've broken this down into steps where it should be really straightforward to implement. OK, Donnie's way too excited about step four. We're going to translate. Yay. So um, we need to know the form of our instructions. And again, this is something that would appear in a specification for an instruction set architecture. In fact, if you open up the giant Intel x86-64 manual, it'll say, this is how you encode instructions. And you really don't care about that unless you're writing a compiler from scratch. So good luck. But uh, anyway, uh, this is the form of the instructions that we need. We also need to know what are our operation codes that we can feed our ALU. Remember, opcodes. And where things are and will be stored. Okay, And then it's just a really straightforward translation. Okay. Remember, first thing we have to compute is 2B. We're going to do it as b plus b, so we look at our little table and say, OK, we have to add b to itself. b is at address 1, so we're going to have both the read addresses be 1. Our opcode is going to be 0001, and we're going to store the result into address 2. Okay, So we just write out the bits for doing that. Okay, Plot 2 equals 2b would be those bits. Notice the right bit is 1, so that we can store it at uh, location 2. 0, 1, 0. Everybody got it? No bugs so far? <laughs> SOT3 is going to be A minus 2B. So again, we have a subtract operation, 0, 0, 1, 1. And uh, our first input is going to be at address 0. 2B is residing at address 2. And we want to store the result at address 3. So we'll have, again, a right bit of 1. Okay. And then slot 7 is going to be that junk bitwise ANDed with our mask. And so we have 1000 is the opcode for that operation. And we just take address 3, address 4, and we store it into address 7. Okay, So again, the right bit is 1. OK, there's a program. It is impenetrable by now, right? Woe to the human being who has to read this. And that's why I feel a little bad, because one of the things you'll do on the first assignment is implement division. <laughs> And you'll implement it at this level. You'll be writing the machine code instructions. People generally find it tedious, which is why I only have you ever do it once. Because it's like, well, you should at least see how it works, but then let's never do this again. Okay? Um, really hard to debug programs in this form. 
So another reason why we like high-level languages. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's pretend to run our program on Slideware because Slideware never fails unless we want it to. Okay, so uh, we need to have this series of three instructions. Our program is very short, right? Three instructions in our instruction memory. We need our initial data value, so whatever A is, whatever B is, and our bit mass, we need to load those things. And we need to initialize our program counter to zero. Okay, then the instructions just, like I said, it's like a machine with a crank on the side, except that the crank is probably a clock somewhere going beep, beep, beep to tell everything to do its jump. Okay, so uh, the instructions execute in sequence, updating memory locations, and if necessary, they can refer to previous memory locations written by previous instructions. Okay, so this is the state of our computer. Instruction memory, data memory, and program counter. So we have this, our beautiful little computer. It just looks gorgeous. Our instruction memory with three instructions, which we believe are correct and we are bug free. And this is our data memory and our program counter is zero. Okay. Now notice I have question marks for some of the locations. What's going to be there? We really don't know, right? I mean, frankly, we don't care. We really only care about the ones that we've specified. Okay, they can be any garbage. Now, in all likelihood, on modern computers, it'll be zeros, but uh, frankly, we just don't care because we're going to overwrite it anyway. The first thing we'll do to that address is write to it, not read from it. Okay? So, program counter is zero. So, our machinery does its thing. The program counter is outputting zero. The instruction memory is outputting the operation that stored it at uh, instruction zero that's feeding into our assembly. The two... Uh, data memories are getting address 1, right, which is where B is stored. So both inputs to the AOU are D, which is what we want, and the control inputs coming down from the instruction memory are saying add those two suckers together. And so out of the bottom of the AOU comes 2B, and that goes back up into the data memories, and it's stored at address 10, okay, in binary, or that would be uh, 2. So where you can see that we've computed those things. Now you may notice already there's a whole bunch of junk going on that I am completely glossing over. All those things don't happen exactly at the same time. Otherwise you probably would have a bit of chaos um, or you'd have to really carefully design that system. So you'll notice that a lot of times processors will do different things at various steps just to execute a single instruction. In fact, um, there's a very sophisticated pipeline of things that happens uh, in modern processors. But we've got to feed the instruction out, let the ALU do its thing, and then the output comes and gets stored. So already we have a few operations or a few steps just to do this one instruction. And then after that's all done, we increment our program counter, go to the next instruction. Okay? Next instruction says subtract. That's 0011 is the subtract opcode, and it just says A is the first argument, 2B was the second argument, so zero, uh, address is 0 and 2, and store the result at address 3. So we do that computation, increment our program counter, and then we do our last instruction, which was the bitwise AND, 1000, that was the bitwise AND opcode, and then we take our value at address 3, our value at address 4, and we bitwise AND them and store the result at address 7. Okay? And so this is the final result. We get our answer in address 7. Any questions? Yes? Sorry. The single one. Which one are we talking about here? Oh, you know, I am missing. So, oh, are you talking about at the program counter? Or where are you talking? Oh, the, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, that's the right bit. That's the one that feeds down to say whether or not we're going to store our answer. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Every single one of our instructions said 1 for the right bit. Why would we ever have a 0 for the right bit? Yeah, do you want to hazard a guess? Um, yeah, that's actually a really good point. If we wanted to look at what we uh, put somewhere... But even then, we're just computing something and throwing away the answer. So that's one of the interesting things about this particular processor design. 
Our right bit is probably always going to be 1 for our current set of instructions. Okay? Um, but in real life, what we do is sometimes we do computations and throw away the answer because we don't care about the answer itself. We care about the status bits that come out of the ALU. So there's a second set of outputs that we sometimes really care about. And the way that x86 is designed, those status bits go up into the logic that controls the program counter. And that allows you to implement branching. If this value is less than 0, I want to go do something else. If this value plus this value is larger than the, some other value. I don't care about the answer. I just care about the result of the comparison. And so in those cases, the ALU does the computation, and then the status outputs tell us what to do. And so that might be a situation where the right bit would actually be 0. But the way we have our processor designed right now, it's really basic. It's really simplistic. And so we're probably always going to have a right bit of 1 for our instructions. OK, yes? Can you read and write the same address in the same instruction? Um, it's basically up to our design, whatever we imagine. Okay? Um, we could say, yes, it's totally possible. And obviously, the hardware would have to support that in some way. Uh, but really, this is a contrived processor design. But let me just tell you this. In the uh, implementation, like this is easy to simulate. And so what you're going to get in the first assignment is a processor simulator. And the processor simulator can definitely support reading and writing the same address in the instruction. I should be careful. I believe it will. So good luck. I hope it does. I think it does. Um, if it doesn't, you should talk to us, and we'll fix that. Um, but yeah, in general, these processors are designed so they can read and modify and write back to the same memory address. Um, we'll just leave it there for now, because we're not talking about real processors yet. OK, any other questions? OK, good. Yes? Do we have to do anything with the results stored in 7? Do we have to do anything with the results stored in 7? No, because um, like obviously if this was a real world computer, then you'd probably want to output that somewhere. So you might have like a bank of LEDs or, or let's say like old incandescent light bulbs if you want to be really cool, or they're like ones and zeros and you know, OK, this is the answer. And you write it down. Um, yeah, so you'd want to output that or store it somewhere. A lot of computers, what they would do is they'd output it to a teletype, a printer. And they'd print out the answer, and then you could take your ream of paper and look at it later. OK? The history of computing is really interesting. Uh, even if you don't end up taking 124, I would at least encourage you to sit in on the first week of lectures, or at least watch them, because the recordings are online. Uh, watch them, because the history of computing is really fascinating, how we've dealt with a lot of these basic issues. Okay. okay, let's hurdle on because we do have quite a bit to cover in the remaining, I think we have what, like 10 minutes? 11.42, yeah, we have a few more uh, minutes to talk. So this is really cool. Like we built a computer and then we programmed it and it computed and it, yeah, it wasn't very exciting what we computed, but we still computed something. So that's, I think that's really exciting. So we implemented a computation. We had this sequence of steps and all of your assembly programming is going to follow steps like this. You figure out where the inputs will be, where the output should go, because those are really important. Those are kind of the interface of your program. You decompose the computation into a series of instructions that can do that task. As, as a, a unit, they can do that task. We assign memory locations for intermediate values, and then we encoded the sequence of instructions for our program. Okay? And so by feeding these instructions into our assembly, our processor, one by one, and having them communicate through memory locations, we can perform our comp computation. Okay? So that's pretty awesome. Okay? And now you make tons of money and embed the internet and Facebook and all the rest. Okay? okay, this was our program. Remember, I already said this is tedious to work in, it's tedious to debug, it's um, really, frankly, what the computer needs, but it's not good for human beings. And so that program is actually called machine code. Because it's what the machine executes. Okay, this is the data that comprises the program. It's the data that the processor uses to know what to do. Okay? It'd be like, I don't know, have any of you uh, seen a, what are they called, like a player piano before? Any, any of you seen a player piano where you give it like a, a, a piece of paper and it's got holes in it? Well, my wife and I were on a trip out to Texas and we, we love going to antique shops. 
and we saw like some of the shops had these rolls that would play music and you'd open it up and you'd see all the holes in in the paper and you're like I wonder what piece of music this is not really easy to tell just by looking at you know the ones and zeros on the roll okay same thing here it's difficult so human beings normally use a language that's one step up and it's kind of the smallest step you could take which is assembly language okay, so I want you all to understand you will probably not be writing machine code except for in the first assignment Okay. Normally, we write assembly language to program processors. And typically, all we do there is we have nice little representations of the various parts of instructions. So you could see, for example, that this might be an assembly language representation of our program that we just wrote. The computer definitely could not consume this. Human beings can work with it much more easily. But it's also really straightforward to translate into... Uh, machine code, okay, which is why assemblers are kind of the easiest kind of compiler you can write. It's a very straightforward thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you can imagine that the uh, various operations would implicitly specify the right bit. So add would say the operand code is well, what whatever it was like one thousand. No, it's zero 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 one. And the right bit should always always be one for this. Okay? And the reason why I say that is because you'll notice that there's other operations like compare, CMP, where that would imply that the right bit is zero. Or test, and the right bit, you know, it'll do a bitwise and, but the right bit will be zero implicitly. Okay? So that tends to be the level that we work at with the uh, uh, assembler. Okay, questions? Pretty cool. So there you go. And already you'll notice that moving to that level is so much nicer. Boy, it just makes life so much easier. Now, um, we are going to talk a little bit about logical and bitwise operations in C code because we need to know how to do bit manipulations. I'm not going to require you to draw logic gates for anything in this class. Um, and so you'll need to know how to implement these various bit manipulation operations in C. You may already know this, so if you do, it'll be great review. Um, we use integers to represent Boolean values, and if you're talking at a logical level, not a bitwise level, a logical level, the way that we represent true and false is just zero is false, anything else is true. Okay? One is true, minus one is true, 83 is true, so forth. The logical operators are typically double ampersand. You'll notice that it's just a double operation. So ampersand ampersand is logical and double pipe or double bar, whichever you decide to call it, is logical or and exclamation point or bang is logical not. Okay? And so the result's going to be one if true or zero if false. So it's a little bit more clearly specified here. These are short circuit operators, which is why you can do things like say if a is not null and a arrow something else is some value. That works because logical and is short circuiting. False and anything is false. So why evaluate anything else? Okay. For logical or, true or anything is true. So why evaluate anything else? So these operators stop the first point where they know the answer. Everybody got it? I'm hoping you already knew this coming into the class. Now there's also a whole bunch of bit manipulation operations that you can use. And so I'm going to give you a couple of values, A and B. You'll notice A is 20 and B is 50. And so you can do bitwise AND by using a single ampersand. Maybe you've accidentally done this at some point, or maybe even intentionally. A single pipe is going to be bitwise OR. A tilde is uh, inversion. So we invert all the bits. That's actually called one's complement inversion. Okay. And you'll notice tilde A is very different from minus A. Okay. We talked about that last time. And the caret is actually used to do exclusive OR. Does this make sense? Okay, cool. So um, the problem that we have with this is that C has no way of representing base 2 literals, as far as I know. There may be a non-standard GNU extension for representing base 2 uh, literals, but I don't remember, so don't quote me. Uh, but typically what people do is they'll use hexadecimal instead of uh, base 10 
because hexadecimal is really nice. Each digit in hexadecimal is a value from 0 to 15, so that will represent 4 bits. And so hexadecimal turns out to be a nice, compact way of representing binary values that you have to hard code into your program. Okay? So 0 to 9, and then A through F. A is 10, B is 11, C is 12, and so forth. Who here has worked with hexadecimal before? Many of you. Okay, great. Um, hopefully it won't be too difficult. It's just base 16. Okay? And obviously, ask me, ask the TAs, we'll be happy to go over any questions you might have. Okay? Uh, the way that you indicate it in a C program is 0x, it can be lowercase x or capital X, and then you have the list of digits that are part of the hexadecimal number. The compiler will see the 0x and realize, oh, this is a hexadecimal literal value. Okay? And so it becomes really easy to translate these back and forth with binary values. Okay, so 03C7, if you have a number like that, 03C7, well, all you have to do is really figure out the four bits that corresponds to each digit, which I have there. 0 is 0000, zero, zero, zero that's easy. C, I'm sorry, 3 is 0011, zero, zero, one, one. we saw that uh, last time. C is going to be 1100, zero, zero. okay? So A is 10, uh, so C is 12, so we have 8 and 4, 8 and 4 are 12, so that one makes sense. And then 7 is 0111. One, one. Okay. Now we can use bitwise and to clear things. So, for example, if we wanted only the low four bits, we could do a bitwise anded with 0f. Or you could just write 0xf if you wanted to. That would work fine as well. So that'll clear the high nibble of a and retain the low nibble. Bitwise or if you wanted to set particular bits. So 0x28, that's going to have two bits set in it the bit at uh, index 3 and the bit at index 5. Remember that when we're talking about bit indexes, this is kind of important, the least significant bit is always on the right, just like when you're writing numbers, the least significant digit is on the right, so the least significant bit is on the right. That's bit 0, and then we count up from there. So 0, 1, 2, 3 is set, and bit 5 is set. Okay. And so if you were to bitwise or A with this, then you would set those two bits, and the rest of them are left alone. Because 0 or whatever is there is going to be whatever is there. Okay? Now, bitwise XOR can be used to toggle bits, which is kind of a fun little trick if you ever need to toggle things. Okay? So A becomes A caret 0x28, so you're going to toggle bits 3 and 5. Okay? And the other bits will be left unchanged. This is the kind of stuff that, well, I guess 5x doesn't exist anymore, but if you do embedded system programming, these kinds of tricks are really helpful. Any questions? Yes? What happens to the two things that you're doing bitwise operations with and have different number of bits? Okay, so that's a good C language question. What happens if the things you're working with have different numbers of bits? We might already be encountering that if A is an int, four bytes, and our constants are clearly one byte. So what happens in C is that the smaller value is promoted to be the same bit width as the larger value. Okay? That is all I'm going to talk about because the, the rules get really crazy and chaotic from there. Okay? So, um, you know, but that's a great question. You should quiz TAs and ask them that kind of Like, what if one's signed and one's unsigned? What will happen there? You know, just um, because there is a whole world in C where it becomes undefined behavior, and that's, we want to stay away from that because then we have chaos. But thankfully, most of the time when we're doing this stuff uh, in CS24, it's all very well defined. Okay, any other questions, quickly? All right. Um, we have bit shifting as well. This is kind of a fun one. So we want to shift A left by N bits, and the new bits on the right will be zero. Okay, and so like we were saying before, if you shift it left, it's like multiple. You shift it left by n bits. It's like multiplying the value by two to the n. Okay, so if I shift 42 left by one bit, it's going to be 84. If I shift right by n bits, it's like dividing by two to the n. Okay, the question is, what should the bits on the left be? Should they always be zero? Well, it really comes down to whether or not we're working with an unsigned value or a signed value. Because if we have a value like minus 24, there's the 8-bit representation for minus 24. How do you get that? Figure out 
plus 24, invert it, and add 1. Just like I was saying last time. Shift it right, it should be minus 12 now. Which means the topmost bit should retain its sign. Everybody see that? That's the tricky part of shifting right. Okay? So, we make a distinction between arithmetic shift right and logical shift right. Okay, arithmetic shift right will preserve the sign bit, whatever the current sign is. If it's zero, it'll stay zero. If it's one, it'll stay one. Okay? Logical shift right always puts zeros in the topmost position. Now, there are languages that distinguish this. Java, um, curiously, has two greater thans for arithmetic shift right, and it has three <laughs> greater thans for doing logical shift right, if you don't care about preserving the sign bit. In x86, there's SAR and there's SUR. So you can pick the instruction that you want to use, depending on what kind of right shift you want. In C, you're kind of screwed. Thank you, C. If you have a signed value, then a shift right will automatically be an arithmetic shift right. It'll preserve the sign. So you say char A equals minus 24. You shift it right, print it out, you'll get minus 12, as you would hope. And if you looked at the assembly code generated, it'll be an arithmetic shift right. If you want it to be a logical shift right, and the type is already not... Uh, unsigned, then you need to cast it to an unsigned type so that you can shift it right. Okay? So if you do the second one, you'll get uh, my, uh, plus 116, because the sign bit will not be preserved. Okay? All right. Again, I'm going to keep you for a few more minutes. Apologies, but we have to set up the next, um, the next part of the lecture, so I'm going to go past that. What if we wanted to multiply something? We don't have a multiply operation, right? Let's implement it. Here is a program that will implement multiplication. It does kind of like long multiplication, if you remember doing that. In, I, I don't even know how they teach this stuff anymore. So uh, let's assume that there's long multiplication and uh, that in elementary school you learn how to do it. You know, you do, uh, you know, multiply the top value by the appropriate digit and the bottom value and the answer is shifted over and then you add everything together and you get your answer. Well, this is the same approach in base 2. The nice thing is, is that when I'm multiplying by a particular bit in a particular position, I either take the value or I don't, because it's just 0 or 1. Something multiplied by 0 is 0. Something multiplied by 1 is that thing. So we're good. So this is basically implementing that in a nice, clever little mechanism where we shift A right so that we can look at the low bit to see if it's 0 or 1. And we shift B left as we do our multiplication so that we can position the bits of B corresponding to the bit in A that we're looking at. And we just add all those together, and that'll be our product. Okay? Clever little algorithm. Can we implement this with our ALU? I mean, yeah, let's ask that question. Can we implement it with our ALU? These are all the control inputs. Well, we can definitely bitwise AND. We can definitely add two things together. And we can definitely shift left and shift right. Right? So that's good. But the question is, can we implement this algorithm on our processor? Do we have anything to do with a while loop? Do we have anything to do with a while loop? No, we don't. We're so sad and angry all at the same time. So basically, we can't. And the reason why is because our processor does not support branching. Okay? We have a very basic thing. Notice? Our processor doesn't support it. Okay? So you see that the way that the hardware is designed limits the kind of programs that you can write. Now, it's interesting. Let me just throw this up here real quick. Um, there are processors for which we do not want branching. GPUs are a great example where we would like to avoid branching at all costs because, well, it turns out that branching makes things slow, okay? which is why we have speculative execution, and that's why we have Spectre. So, um, problems, right? So, our processor is limited in what we can do with it. And so, we basically need to extend the implementation here so that we can do this uh, more sophisticated program. So, let me just throw this up here. Um, you can see that there's a number of things we'd like to fix. And so, what we'll do next lecture is start addressing some of these limitations. I just wanted to mention 
uh, as a reminder, there, there will not be class on Friday. Our next class will be on Monday. So I will see you on Monday.